Let me invite you to open your copy of God's Word to our New Testament Scripture lesson, which comes from the first chapter, the book of Hebrews. This morning I'll read verses 1 through 4. We'll be looking primarily at verses 2 and 3. Let me invite you now to give your attention to the reading of God's holy and inerrant and inspired word that in its reading you might see Christ. Hebrews chapter 1. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, He has spoken to us by His Son, whom He appointed the heir of all things through whom also He created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of His nature. And He upholds the universe by the word of His power. After making purification for sins, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Let's pray. Our good and gracious Father, we thank you that you have spoken to us by your Son. Lord, as we come together as those called by his name to worship Christ, as we take these moments to look at how your word has revealed who Christ is and what he has done to us, would you open our eyes that we would see? Would you open our ears that we would hear? Would you open our hands that we would receive? Would you open our hearts that we would believe? Father, we thank you that while the grass withers and the flower fades, the word of the Lord stands forever. Amen. As we come to this great Christological passage of Hebrews chapter 1, as I sat and studied and meditated and thought about this passage throughout the last week and really last two weeks, the words of uh, one of the most eminent theologians of our time came to my mind, perhaps one of the greatest theologians ever. Rick Flair. If you're unfamiliar with Rick Flair, 16-time WWE world champion professional wrestler, bombastic, over-the-top showman, would wear ornate fur-lined robes with sequins. He described himself as a Rolex wearing, diamond ring wearing, kiss stealing, wheeling dealing, limousine riding, jet flying, son of a gun. But as our eminent theologian always said, if you want to be the man, you've got to beat the man. And the author of Hebrews is presenting Jesus Christ as the man. He is the man, the very high point of all of human history. He is the focal point of all of Scripture. He's the man. When Jesus encounters two travelers on the road to Emmaus in Luke 24, he tells them, he says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning about himself. Jesus said, look at all of your Bible. It's all pointing back to me. Matthew 13, 17, Jesus spoke about the point of the parables. He says, for truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. What did the prophets want to see? They wanted to see the hope of the redemption of a Messiah. And Jesus said, here I am. Jesus tells us in John 8, 56, Abraham rejoiced at seeing the day of Christ. He saw it and he was glad. Stephen in Acts chapter 8, he encounters an Ethiopian traveling and the Ethiopian is reading Isaiah chapter 53. And Philip says, do you understand what you are reading? 
And the Ethiopian says, how can I understand unless someone explains it to me? And so Philip, in Acts 8, verse 35, says, beginning with this scripture, he told him the good news about Jesus. Jesus is the point of the scriptures. From the earliest of time, all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, a promise of a redeemer had been made. There was an eschatological hope. There was a goal, there was a purpose for all of creation that finds its center and its reason in the person of Jesus Christ. He is the focus of all of Scripture. He was foreshadowed in the old and realized in the new. He was promised in the old, he was fulfilled in the new. He is preeminent, he is the hope, he is the joy, he is the crown of all things. He is the man. And the author of Hebrews opens up this letter by showing how God has revealed himself to us by speaking to us by his Son. And this is how he describes that Son. That Son is the creator and the sustainer of all things. He is the radiance of God. He is the fulfillment of righteousness. Jesus, the Son of God, is the creator and the sustainer of all things. The author of Hebrews in verses 2 through 4 layers a couple of relative clauses to describe the Son. He says, By whom God has spoken to us, who is this Son, the Son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. He is the creator and the sustainer. This letter flows from the idea of the son to the idea of an heir. Sons are natural heirs. Now the son in this passage for the author of Hebrews is the very same person the psalmist refers to in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm 2 verses 7 through 8, The Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. We know the author of Hebrews has this psalm in mind because in verse 5, in just a few verses, he's not just going to reference it, he will quote it. The psalmist and the author of Hebrews are speaking of Jesus in his role as the Messiah. Jesus is set to inherit the nations. He is set to make the ends of the earth his possession. But Hebrews takes it a step further. It's not just the world, but it is all things. Colossians 1.16 tells us that all things were created for him. They were made for Jesus. All things belong to Jesus. And we're not just talking about the physical universe, though we certainly include that. What he is specifically referring to is the same thing that Paul refers to in Ephesians 1.18. He's speaking of the redeemed. Ephesians 1.18 tells us that you, the redeemed of Christ, are the riches of his glorious inheritance. We, the saints of God, are the highly prized jewel in Christ's crown. We live in a world that's constantly sending us mixed and inconsistent messages about our worth and our value. On the one hand, we might quote Henley's poem, Invictus. I am the master of my fate, I am the captain of my soul. And we might think that we really are God. But we also live in a society that continually tells us that you you are a cosmic hiccup. You are a lucky blip. An accident of evolutionary process. We are told to ignore our faith, believe in a process that declares that you are really nothing more than dirt that became self-aware. You're an animal that benefited from having opposable thumbs, and yet you remain a slave to biological impulses. This is a mixed message that's sent to us. You are God and you are dirt. But the Scriptures say that you're more. The Scriptures affirm, you are dirt. 
But you are dirt that the almighty and omnipotent God has breathed his spirit into. And you are made in his image. You are the riches of Christ's glorious inheritance. So beloved, do not sell yourself short. Do not demean or diminish your value. Do not call rubbish what Christ calls the riches of his inheritance. He is the heir of all things, and above all things, he cherishes you. He's the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. The, the word translated here in the Greek for world is actually the word for ages. Now, its meaning's not restricted to simply a temporal sense. It's not just talking about time, that he created all time, but it's meant in a holistic sense. He created all time and all space. He means all of space and time here. Now, we can think about the span of the universe. Our galaxy is an average-sized galaxy, it's about 100,000 light years across. That means if you were traveling at the speed of light across our galaxy, it would take 100,000 years to cross it. That is a long time for are we there yet. Our galaxy is average size. It's one of roughly 100,000 million galaxies. The average distance between galaxies is 3 million light years. What does this tell us? The universe is big. And yet Isaiah tells us that God holds the entire universe in the span of his hand, between his thumb and his little finger. The universe is also incredibly intricate. God created every speck of dust in that vast universe. Every atom, every subatomic particle, every cell in your body bears the glorious fingerprint of God. From the vast expanse of outer space to the invisible particles of inner space, God created all of space and all of time. And God did this through Jesus Christ. All things were not only made for Him, but they were made through Him. We can go back to Colossians 1.16. He says, For by Him, that is by Jesus Christ... All things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. The author of Hebrews is going to highlight this point more. He's going to talk about Jesus being greater than Moses. In Hebrews 3.2, he's going to talk about Jesus as greater than Moses. Moses was great because he was faithful in all of God's house. But he's going to say Jesus was greater, greater because Jesus built the house. Moses was faithful in the house. Jesus built the house. Jesus is over all things because all things were made through him. The early church pastor Athanasius put it this way, when the sacred writers say that he is before all ages and that through him he created the world, they proclaim the eternal and everlasting being of the Son and thereby designate him God. This is why the author of Hebrews doesn't hesitate in verse 10 of our chapter to apply to the Son the words of Psalm 102. You, Lord, laid the foundation of the earth in the beginning and the heavens are the work of of your hands. So many people struggle with life today. What's the point? Where do I find meaning? Now this makes sense if we think that all things, if we think the world, if we think the universe, if we think everything that we know and experience and can see is just one big cosmic accident. If there's no point... If there's no goal, if there's no meaning, if there's no purpose, if there's no right and wrong, if we are only in this moment, what's the point? There's not one. You just are until you aren't. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. 
we live as a society in this way, and yet we act stunned when anxiety and depression skyrocket in society. But if Jesus is the creator of the universe, then all of this is not an accident. There is purpose. There is meaning. There is a goal and there is a point to your life. God made you. He made you with a purpose. He made you for a reason. You matter. You aren't just matter, but you actually matter. Jesus is the creator of all things. And he is the sustainer of all things. The universe was not just initiated by God through the Son and left to its own devices. God has created all things. He ordains all things. He orders and directs all things toward their fulfillment and their purposes. From the beginning to the end, God sustains his creation. God spoke all things into existence, and they maintain their existence because God sustains them by his providence. If God ceased to sustain creation, then creation would cease. Now Hebrews tells us this is done by the word of his power. Just as God spoke in creation, he speaks in sustaining. The word of the Son is the same word as the word of the Father. They speak in perfect harmony. They speak with a perfect unity of will. And just as God speaks and creates out of nothing, the Son sustains the world with a self-sufficiency. He relies upon nothing else. Now, we actually see a picture of this all the way in the Old Testament when we see Moses encounters a burning bush in Exodus chapter 3. The flame of the fire in the bush was the very presence of God before him. Moses looks at this bush as it burns, and he notices something about it. It is burning, yet the bush was not consumed. If something's on fire, it requires three things. It requires heat, oxygen, and fuel. Right? And everything that burns, burns up that fuel. The fire is sustained by burning the fuel. Fire does not exist unless it burns some type of fuel. God's presence needs no fuel. It sustains itself. It is sufficient in and of itself. The flame that represented the presence of God was self-sufficient power. The upholding of the universe by the power of the Son's Word is sustained by the Son's self-sufficient power. We are not sufficient like this. Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians 3, 5, we are not sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us, but our sufficiency is from God. Just as we cannot create something out of nothing, we cannot sustain ourselves. Some of you don't believe that. Some of you will tell me, yes, I believe that, but I look at your lives and I know you don't actually believe that. And I know that because you look like the performer on the stage with 20 different plates spinning on poles. And you're spinning the plate on the pole, and you're like, no, no, that one's wobbling. I've got to get that one, and that one's going to wobble off. This one's going to fall, and this one's crashing. And you live your life with a low-grade anxiety waiting for the next plate to fall. You know what I'm talking about. You know all the things going on in your life, and you need to hear this truth, and you need to let this truth set you free. You cannot sustain it all. You never could. God will sustain whatever needs to be sustained. He will use your faithful efforts. You are not unimportant. But you also need to understand that you are not all important. You can give up trying to sustain the universe by sheer willpower and grit. Because you can't. You aren't supposed to. 
Do you think you're actually keeping the plate spinning in the first place? The only thing you are sustaining in all of this is your own anxiety. He upholds the universe by the power of his word, not you. And let that free you. Let the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus does free you because he is the creator and he is the sustainer. The author of Hebrews continues on as he begins to talk about the person and the work of Jesus Christ. And as he does this, this verse is picked up by the early church to address many of the early heresies in the church. The majority of the heresies addressed by the early church were heresies of a Christological nature. What we mean by that is Christology is the study of the person and the work of Jesus. Who is he? What does he do? And largely, these early church heresies dealt with how Jesus was fully God and fully man. Jesus had two natures, a divine nature and a human nature, yet they were in one person. And in these discussions and in these debates and these reflections on these topics, the early church fathers often came back to Hebrews 1-3. Verse 3 is particularly frequently cited by the church fathers to refute the idea that the Son was anything less than the Father. When Athanasius was refuting the Arian heresy, this verse was frequently on his lips. One early theologian speculated that this verse, verse 3, and verse 3 alone, is the reason many of the Arians said that Hebrews does not deserve to be in the canon. What does this verse say about the Son? says he is the radiance of the glory of God. The sun burns bright in our solar system. But we would never experience its light or its warmth if its beams never radiated out into space and landed upon the earth. It is the same with God and the sun. The sun is the radiance of the glory of God. Jesus the Son brilliantly reveals the glory of God. Without the Son, S-U-N, we would be in the dark. And without the Son, S-O-N, we would be in the dark. The text here uses the word radiance. Now there's a translation question here. This word radiance, it can be translated as radiance if it's meant in an active sense, but if it's a passive sense, it could actually mean reflection. But there's a huge difference between the two, and I believe radiance is the proper way to understand this, just as the moon reflects the light and the sun radiates light. Jesus does not simply just reflect God's glory, But Jesus radiates God's glory. He is God's glory. We see a couple of examples of this through the scriptures. Jesus on the Mount of Transfiguration, he was not reflecting light, but rather he was radiating light. Jesus encounters Paul on the road to Damascus. Paul is blinded by a brilliant light that comes from Jesus himself. This is akin to something like the Shekinah glory that would settle upon the tabernacle or upon the temple when God's special presence was there. This is Revelation 21, the New Jerusalem. The New Jerusalem has no need for sun or moon to shine on it, for the glory of God gives its light, and its lamp is the Lamb. Athanasius said, Who does not see that the brightness cannot be separated from the light, but that it is by nature proper to it and coexistent with it and is not produced after it? This is why in those early Christological heresies, when when the fathers came together and they crafted a creed to address these heresies, the Nicene Creed was drawn together to address these Christological heresies, and they used these words that Jesus Christ is God of God, light of light, and very God of very God. He is light of light because he is the radiance of the glory of God. Then he tells us that the Son is the exact imprint of his nature. 
And the word for imprint here is actually the Greek word character. This comes from a verb that means to kind of etch into something, and the idea is like a stamp. If you were going to mint a coin, you would stamp that coin, and that coin would have the exact image as the stamp upon it. But the stamp and the image are separate. Jesus is completely the same as the Father. However, there is a distinction. The Father and the Son are separate. The Father is not the Son, and the Son is not the Father. Now, we're beginning to touch here on the mystery of the Holy Trinity, and that is good, Right? We need to stretch our minds a little bit to try to understand this, but we should be careful to only say that which Scripture says and to avoid speculation in order to resolve tensions that exist in our minds. The Son is the radiance of God's glory. He is very God of very God. He is light of light. But He is also the imprint of God and separate from God. All right. Obscure early church father time. Theodore of Mopsuestia. All right? Collected works, anybody? Nope. Okay. He was a 4th century theologian. He was a close friend of John Chrysostom. Chrysostom, who has the best Greek translation for his name. He was known as an excellent preacher. His name translates to Golden Tongue. All right? You get born with the name Golden Tongue. You've got one career path. That's it. Right, Theodore makes this connection with our Hebrews passage in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He says the statement, the Word was with God, is the equivalent of the exact imprint of His nature. And the Word was God is the equivalence of the radiance of the glory of God. Right? We see that they are one and the same, and yet they are also separate. Chrysostom adds that this helps walk the difference between two enduring heresies. On the one hand, there's a heresy of seeing Jesus as less than fully God, like Arianism. And on the other hand, is the heresy of seeing no distinction between the, two pers- the three persons of the Godhead, like modalism. What this idea of the radiance of the glory of God and also the exact imprint of his nature, it allows us to walk the fine line between these heresies. Now that's a whole lot of complicated doctrine. That's a lot of early church history for us. So what's the takeaway? What is the takeaway about the radiance and the imprint of God? The Father whom we cannot see. He condescended to us in sending us the Son whom we can see. The Son was incarnate. He walked among us. He took on flesh to live the life that we could not and to die the death that we should. And because Jesus is the perfect radiance and imprint of God, He reveals to us a saving knowledge of God. John Calvin put it this way, When you hear that the Son is the glory of the Father's glory. Bear in mind that the glory of the Father is invisible. It is invisible to you until it shines forth in Christ. And that He is called the very image of His substance because the majesty of the Father is hidden until it shows itself as impressed on His image. The takeaway here is that because this is true, you are able to know God. You can know God through Jesus Christ, His Son. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of His nature. And our response is to let that fill us with glory and with delight and with joy and with blessing and with praise. The supremacy of of Christ. He is better than anything else. This really begins to shine as we look at these facets of his character. He is the man. But all of this is really just nice, ethereal, pie in the sky. Maybe this is good for intellectuals and academics to do. Um, but it doesn't matter to us 
His goodness doesn't matter to us unless it begins to interact with our actual, real, nitty-gritty, dirt-in-the-fingernails life. When we see that, when we see that Jesus is the creator and the sustainer of all things, that he is the radiance of God, that he is the exact imprint of his nature, when we see this and we see that it meets us in the raw and unfiltered mess of our lives, then he really begins to show to us why he is the man. Here we see the son's work as the greater high priest. Now, the letter of Hebrews is going to elaborate on this quite a bit as we go through. For now, he keys in on two aspects, purification and ruling. After making purification for sins, Jesus fulfills the office of the priest in his once offering of himself a sacrifice. When John the Baptist sees Jesus at the Jordan River, he declares, Behold, the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. The Son laid down His life for our sins, making purification at the cross. Now there's an issue here with the verb about the tenses that sometimes shows up in our English translations. And this is largely because of a Latin quirk. The verb tenses from Greek to Latin don't match. And as it was brought over, and as the Latin influences our English, sometimes we make this verb sound like it is an ongoing activity of the Son. A Roman Catholic translation might look like this, that, that Jesus is making purification for sins. Now they see this because they see it in the regular Mass that they partake in, and that that is a participation in the actual blood and uh, body of Jesus Christ. And when the priest lifts the elements, they participate in that exact moment in the sacrifice that happened 2,000 years ago, and it's still ongoing. This also fits with the idea of a purgatory, that there is an ongoing purging of the sins of your life. But that's not what the text says here. This was a once and for all activity done by the Son at the cross. This is a fulfillment of Leviticus 16 when a sacrificial goat was uh, slaughtered and the blood was shed on the Day of Atonement. The guilt and stain and penalty of sin was wiped away. It was nailed to the cross once and for all. The almighty, omnipotent, universe-creating, cosmos-sustaining, incomprehensible embodiment of divine light and character was nailed to the cross so that your broken, fallen, sin-loving, rag-covered, blasphemy-spouting, and wretched self could be made clean. Purified. Made pure. That's you. If you are in Christ, you have been made clean. What can wash away these sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And we know that this was a once and for all sacrifice that was accomplished, that was completed in history, because after making purification of sins, he sat down. The work of the priest did not allow for the priest to sit down. Kent Hughes makes this point on this passage when he talks about the high priest would go in once a year to the Holy of Holies and sewn into the hem of the priest's garments were bells. The reason is, as he would go into the Holy of Holies, he was constantly moving, constantly doing activity, constantly making purification for sins for the people that had to go on every year. And he had bells on the hems of his garment because if they didn't hear the bells outside of the Holy of Holies, they knew he stopped moving and you would only stop moving if you were dead. And you were dead because the holiness of God had struck him down. And so he had a rope tied to his foot. And if you didn't hear the bells, you drug him out because you dare not enter into the Holy of Holies and touch something dead. Jesus made purifications for sins and he sat down. Why? 
Because on the cross, he said, it is finished. It was a once and for all work that he did. Jesus sat down. The work is done. Martin Luther makes this brilliant observation. He says, by these words, Jesus makes short work of all notions of righteousness and every idea of penances which the natural man holds. It is the supreme mercy of God, he commends. Therefore we, much, uh, therefore, we much despair of our own penances and our own purging of sins, because before we even begin to confess, our sins have already been forgiven. I would go on to say that it is not till then, that is, until we despair of our own penance and purging, that Christ's own purging becomes operative and produces true penitence, in us. It is this way that his righteousness works our righteousness. What Luther is saying and what the author of Hebrews is explaining is that you cannot save yourself by your own works. You cannot make purification for your own sins. Only Jesus fulfills our righteousness. Only Jesus can make atonement. Only Jesus purifies. If you want to be clean, if you want to stand before a holy God as righteous, if you want to be free of the guilt and stain of your sin, then there is one way, and that is to trust in Jesus. Only a perfect work of sacrifice can satisfy the holiness of God. Only Jesus can make purifications of sin such that it is complete, that he could then sit down. Only Jesus Christ saves. Jesus made purification, and then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Jesus is the prophet, priest, and king. He is the ruler of righteousness. He is the fulfillment of Psalm 110. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand. This is the place of highest honor. This is to see Christ seated in glory. The work of purification is done, but the work of sustaining the universe continues. The work of interceding on our behalf continues. The work of ruling the cosmos continues continues because he is our king forever. Jesus is exalted on high. He is higher than any other. He is the man. Jesus is greater than. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Father, we, we ask that as you have spoken to us through your word, as you have displayed Jesus Christ to him, that he would be glorious to our eyes and to our hearts. Lord, we simply ask that you would have us leave here with a holy longing for Christ. That we would see that he is greater than anything else. We ask this in that very same name, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.